All right, welcome to the podcast on today's show. We're talking about the new bar, the founder, Brianda. Thanks for joining. For people who don't know, what's your company do? The new bar is a curated non-alcoholic discovery platform and bottle shop. We started in Venice, but we have locations in Venice, West Hollywood, San Francisco, and uh, we do all kinds of other things all over the U.S. So much to dive into. I'm opening up a sports bar, so I'm really curious on what are people doing? Are they drinking? Are they not drinking? I've heard before people are obviously, the younger generation seem to be drinking mm. less. I think I've seen that. Yep. First of all, cheers. I don't know what this is. Cheers. Tell the people what this is. Right now we're drinking at Tilden, which is, uh, this is a pre-mixed cocktail. I think it drinks like a gin-based, it's, it's not like immediately replicating something you're familiar with, but it drinks kind of like a Japanese gin cocktail. That's good. Yeah, it's okay. refreshing. Really refreshing. Really nice. What made you want to get into this space? Do you drink? Did you want to drink less? What's the personal story? Yeah, so I, I do enjoy all kinds of drinks. It's why I love this job. I grew up on Catalina Island off the coast of LA. If you've ever visited. I've never been. Okay, you've got to go. Basically, it's 26 miles off the coast of LA. It feels like a different world. And there's this one square mile town of Avalon. In that one square mile, there's 16 bars. How many tennis courts? <laughs> one. <laughs> Only okay. one that I could think of. Um, 16 bars. 16 bars. That seems like a lot. It's a lot. And the entire economy is driven by hospitality. So it's food and beverage and, in particular, a lot of alcohol. That's the context I grew up in. My dad's a bartender by trade, and I've worked in, in restaurants uh, my whole life. I went on to start my career in tech in the Bay Area and didn't think too much of it, but a few years ago, my dad got really sick. And you have this like super healthy guy. All of a sudden, he's like in and out of the hospital. We basically found out he has an autoimmune illness that we didn't know about. Alcohol is really bad for your immune system. Uh, it's a super inflammatory thing. And so through the process, I was just fascinated by the category because I was looking for things that would let me and him enjoy that act of mixology that he loves so much and that I love so much with him. And I just discovered this whole world of non-alc and it got my attention. I couldn't let it go. Okay. So what was your first step? And so, first of all, I'm sorry that happened to you. And you're He's dead. doing well, I will say. Okay. So he's getting yeah, better. So we're good. And so what's your first step in going down this journey? The rabbit hole. Well, if you know anything about Instagram Target, And what year, what year was this, by the way? This was 2021. Okay. So not COVID. Got it. All right. Yeah. So three years ago. Okay. Yeah. So if you know anything about like, I don't know, if you've ever been a normal person on the internet, you know that if you search one thing or yep. it goes. hover over an ad for a little bit, you start getting targeted by all of them. So I first started by looking around and Googling things. So I discovered like a hop tea. Then I started getting targeted by a bunch of brands that I had never heard of. Okay. So I'd order the things directly from the website, and sometimes they were great, and a lot of the time they also were not so great. So I basically started geeking out over this and feeling like there was probably a better way and a more curated and centralized way to explore the category. So I made this crazy spreadsheet with 700 products that I found from... So there's 700 products out there in this space. At this point in time in yeah. 2021, yeah. Wow, um, okay. So there's you know a number of brands with multiple SKUs, if you will. But sure. I was like, here are all the products I want to try. Yep. I'm going to source them from all over the world. And then I just started kind of documenting all of my notes on them, whether they tasted the way they said they did, if I used it in the recipe that the brand recommended, did it live up to you know the yeah. standard? This is so funny. I just, I couldn't kind of stop did you thinking add, about did it. Did you add the spirit to any of this? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the first I, time I had an alcoholic yeah. drink, I literally like, I was like, I'm going to add tequila. I feel like this would be an excellent mixer. Literally. Um, I think the beauty of the non-alcoholic category is that it gives you flexibility. I'll tell you, you know, at events where we uh, have our cocktails and there's also alcohol served, we see people like going back and forth between alcoholic or non-alcoholic. Okay. So they'll alternate drinks, but then they'll come to our, our bar and they're like, these are so much better than yeah. the alcoholic drinks. I almost want to, when I do have an alcoholic drink, That's right. use yours as a base because the quality. It's is still just, the same craftsmanship. Yes. Yeah. It's just they or just remove sometimes. the spirit or more sometimes. Yeah. 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 David Chang has this funny video that he just put out on Instagram where he's like, look, if I'm selling, if I'm serving you a mocktail and it's $21 and a regular cocktail is $22, like don't be upset. Sometimes yeah. the mocktails take much more work. 
Yeah. Or, you know, a little bit, just because the spirit isn't inside of it doesn't mean the spirit is the leading ingredient in terms of cost. Mm. Like you still have the labor. Yeah. You might be juicing a little bit longer. You never know what's happening behind the scenes. But he was basically like, it could be the same price or more. Just chill out. Yeah. A lot of restaurants, especially like the higher end, you know, really uh, folks who really specialize in their craft will make their own kind of concoctions and interesting things. And it does require a lot of great raw ingredients. Yeah. I think within the non-alcoholic category, a lot of the time people don't understand why there's a premium price to pay. But many of these products have actually gone through every step that an alcoholic product went through. Yeah. Same quality ingredients. Uh, some of them were alcoholic at one point, and then they have to be de-alcoholized. So it's quite a, a labor of love, and yeah. it is expensive to, to make a really high quality product. All right, yeah. so you're at you could do you have 700, you got the Rolodex, you're narrowing it down to the ones you love. Yeah. And then you're at these events, and then at some point you're like, okay, let's start the store. Like at what point does it yeah. hit you to to go, let's take this to the consumer? Yeah, so I basically noticed the two things, right? One is there's so much friction in the discovery process and finding a good product. Smart, that's true. It's, that's true. You know, I can I can relate to that. And I have a podcast where I get a bunch of products sent we yeah. have, you know, we get products sent to us. Yeah. And sometimes I hate them, I'll be honest. Yeah. Yeah. It, it takes a while. And there's something for everybody. So, you know, taste is subjective. There is that. But within that, there's quality for sure. And there are standards. So I noticed there was all this friction. And then I also looked around. You know, I was 26, 27 at the time. And so I looked around. And I was like, okay, I'm a normal cool-ish girl. You're so cool. I'm a coolish woman. <laughs> um, I'm like, I'm, you know, I don't want to go sit in a field right now and like meditate about never drinking again. You know, I'm, I'm definitely not pregnant. And I personally uh, just felt that a lot of the messaging in the category was either speaking to a very specific niche within the consumer base or was being marketed in a way that didn't feel appealing or representative to somebody like me. And so I thought, okay, this is obviously incredible. It's totally changed the way I drink. I'm looking around and I see that Gen Z and millennials are actually the ones driving this category the forward. Change, yeah. But nobody's talking to them or yes. showing up where they are. That's right. And then I became obsessed with the idea of solving that problem. Okay. So I started working on the new bar initially as an online only concept. And the idea was let's remove some of the, the noise, do some quality control do some education and have an online resource where people can find all of the best the category has to offer from all over the world. But I always knew I wanted some sort of in-person component because people drink in community. That's right. It's and still social. Yeah. It's you still a want to sit act. by the fire. You still want the pizza. You still want the drink. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, I looked into a number of things, whether it was pop-up bars or like a little traveling non l truck, if you will. And then I stumbled upon this incredible little retail space that felt like a really safe bet that I could totally stomach. That sounds crazy, though, a oh, little it's crazy. bit, right? It's a little crazy. I hear it say, you said safe bet, but to me, that's a little <laughs> bit crazy to have this idea. Yeah. But, yeah. I had a thesis that wherever there's a drink, a strong drinking culture, and there are people who are also health-oriented, there's going to be a demand for what I'm trying to create. Venice's makes sense for that. Okay. Venice made a lot of sense. Santa Monica um, makes yeah, got yeah, it. Yeah, okay. close to where I live. Uh, I saw this space. It was a it's a 450 square foot store, and I looked at it and I was like, this has some good bones. I can turn this it seems on. So crazy to me. It's it really <laughs> does. Like I hear you and I, I I get the logic and I love the thesis, but it just seems you're like what a kooky lady. To no, go no, do that. no. I just I mean, look, all entrepreneurs take risks, right? Yeah. And so I appreciate the risk, but it just if we were friends at the time, yeah, I probably would have said, "Let's rethink. Mm -hmm. Show me the. What are you seeing? Where's your crystal oh, ball?" Oh, a lot of my friends said that. Right. A lot of my friends right. were like, "Oh, that's interesting. Like, how does it's that? Not what a bad is this idea. category? No, they were like, I, I get it, but I, like, right. are you sure? And then maybe that's what makes it such a good idea. Yeah, okay. I think it's a lot of the time the things that people are a little bit skeptical at first. That's not to say everyone should go do things your friends tell you not to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Probably take their advice in some scenarios. But I knew I was going to do an in-person component to it. And I genuinely looked at the economics of what it would take me to spin it up versus even buying a truck or doing... This is delicious, by the way. Thank like, you. really, really good. Um, we have other stuff I want you to try, too. And so I, I decided to take a bet on it. And 
I started working on the new bar in January of 2022. By July of 2022, we had launched online and opened our first location. And did you ever think about carrying liquor? Not really. Okay. Not at, definitely not then. I wouldn't really say I'm even heavily considering it now. Yeah. It was really about, I should be able to have the same experience uh, as I would if I went to like a really high-end, nice wine shop and I walked in I said here's what I like here's what I don't like here's what I'm having for dinner what do you recommend so then you open so then I open and then tell me what tell me what happens how are you marketing this Mm because like when I so you mentioned Hayo off air Mm -hmm. and so when I talked to them I was thinking like all right who is who is your consumer is it the Gen Z is it the younger crowd and they said it's some of that but it's also the mom it's also the people that just want to drink less right and so there's this massive market that is not so much I would say as black and white as the younger generation who are clearly mm-hmm. drinking less. It's yeah. like just the, I don't know what they even call them, like the non al curious. Yeah, you know, like the, the, the sober curious. The sober curious will, the, people. Yeah, the mindful drinking uh, Whatever folks. that means, yeah, them. Yeah. Which one of these should I have next, by the way, before you? I kind of feel you should try the Negroni? phony Negroni because you're a Negroni fan too. The phony so. Negroni. Great this name. one's really cool. It's a company called St. Agrestus. They actually started with alcoholic drinks. So they make like incredible vermouths and bitters and interesting things. And then they started producing the phony Negroni. And I think now it's one of their top performing products. I can't wait. Yeah. All right. So it's fun. Yeah. You open up. So I open up thinking about marketing. I knew for sure that I, when I built the brand, I wanted it to definitely be cool enough and interesting enough that a Gen Z individual could walk in and be like, I've arrived but not so edgy or even not so aspirational that any other person who walked by or encountered the brand online couldn't Mm. see themselves in it. Wouldn't be curious, yeah. Yeah, so there's always, you know, it's So it's approachable. It's red, it's bright, but it's approachable. There's color in our stores. There's color on our website. Really smart. We show people in social settings doing oftentimes a lot of the things you would do when you're when you're drinking. Sure. sure. It's really not like it's rocket, really not science, rocket right? science, right? Yeah, yeah. It's not rocket science, but it's like, okay, I don't have to be journaling and uh, having a, a deep reflection to enjoy a non alcoholic beverage. Is that, okay. That's so that was the idea. A lot of our early traction, and honestly to this date, has been really, really organic and it has been really rooted in that community based growth. So from day one, We're hosting events in store, partnering a lot with like mission aligned and demographic aligned brands. We definitely see that like the mom crowd loves us for sure. But part of why they love us is because it feels like a fun place to be. And it's a new, more interesting and and like lighthearted take on a thing that is important to them, but they don't want to, I don't know, they don't want to have to have like a really somber Sure. come to moment to make some better habits built. And so when you open, are you feeling, how, what are, what are the sales like? A slog, like you're really having to talk these people through? Because I'm sure you're educating a market in real time. For sure. And so you're educating was... a market. Honestly, the first two months were better than I had modeled or anticipated, which is encouraging. But we really saw things take off in month three. Okay. So all of a sudden, I think like month three, our sales doubled over the previous month. And then they kind of continued an upward trajectory from there. Um, I think we got a little bit of early, like people started paying attention. We got some press and a lot of that like word of mouth kind of programming started to work uh, locally in Venice and then spread to LA. That is good. The Negroni. That is really good. It's good, right? I had one I'll tell you off air that I hated. Oh, I wonder what it was. You probably know what it is. This is delicious. This is nice because it's oh my really God. I bitter. I feel like I'm drinking right now, but yeah. I'm not. Okay. And then they play with a little bit of effervescence. So there's like a tiny little bit of a sparkle, a bubble to it mm-hmm. that I think replicates a little bit of that bite yeah. you're familiar with. Okay. And so when it comes to people that are trying to drink this, what is the one thing that they're not educated on? Like, for example, I don't think people who have a regular Negroni understand how many how much sugar is actually in it. In a regular Negroni. I don't think people yeah. understand there's sugar in alcohol, actually. I know. It's funny because it people weird. talk about non-alcoholic drinks or mocktails, and they're like, oh, I would drink them, but they're so sugary. Right, right. And you hear that a lot. Yeah. 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 So and I guess if you're at, drinking like a tequila soda, sure, no problem. Right. But if, or anything, just soda. Right. But if you're thinking about wine even, just the, the sugar content in that yeah. and the calorie intake from that versus the non-alcoholic counterpart, you're going to have like at most a third 
sometimes as little as like a fifth of the sugar and the calorie value of the alcoholic counterpart. Um, and so it's a an interesting mis- like misconception that we often have to educate. How do you do that? Do, educate. You, do you do that a lot? And I'm just asking, yeah. like, I really don't know. It's your business. So, yeah, but yeah, to yeah. me, it's like, I could see someone look like I just did. I looked, yes. I turned it over, how much yeah. sugar. Yeah. When you get a cocktail served to you at the bar, no one's saying it. No and one, so your because job, alcohol is not labeled. It's not labeled at all. Yeah. And so your job is almost to tell them it's better for you. Yes. But how do you do that? In some, I mean, physically in person, obviously, it's a lot easier. I literally am grabbing bottles all day, turning it around and contextualizing what, what I'm seeing. I think online, it's it's educational content a lot of the time. And it's just being really consistent with like really showcasing side by side the difference. Okay. And so you're onto something at some point and you start thinking, let's expand more locations. Yeah. So we've got, let's So see. it's working. You were like, this is working. It's working. And who it's is, great. And what did you learn about your customer? Or maybe you nailed it. Maybe you're like, mm. oh, this is the, like, what did you learn about who your customer is? Yeah. I learned our customer's primarily occupy the 25 to 45 age range. So you for okay. sure get the young parents. That's young. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's young. But a lot of, yeah, I think a lot of people assume it's like, I don't know, your older aunt or something. And totally that's part of it. This is, I'm not saying it's 100% 20 to 40, 25 to 45, but I would say about 70%, 70 to 80% of our consumer base lives in that space. Okay. The market is a little bit female leaning, but less than I expected. And that was nice, I think, because I felt that a lot of the category was super marketed only towards women. Interesting. Yeah, I think a lot of it was... Um, Do you have an example of that? Like a brand? I really don't know any, but... Yeah, I I mean... You mean like in terms of like like this as an example? You mean in terms of the products? So like this bottle from Gia is actually probably more feminine than some of the other ones I've seen. But if you looked at like a lot of the content around the category uh, was very feminine. You know, there there are were at the time a couple of other online platforms that, that were curating products, but it was like very pink and very like super ultra premium to an extent that I think made it less accessible to a lot of people who would benefit from it and otherwise be into it. So I definitely learned that while the category is female leaning, you can absolutely appeal to the male demographic. And there's there's a lot of loyalty there, actually. I think the thing I feel most happy about validating um, early on was this idea that people wanted to, to be in person a lot of the time, that they wanted to have the same experiences. And that wherever there's a lot of drinking, there's a lot of people looking for the other ways to drink as mm. well. And so once you have your other locations open, Mm -hmm. what are you learning at that point? What are you seeing in the marketplace? Yeah. So in 2023, we only had one location at the time. I think we are like four months old. And then I, following the thesis that wherever there's a lot of drinking, there's people looking for non-alcoholic options, got this idea that this should be at festivals and at larger, you know, cultural moments where people in my demographic are going and where you have a really great opportunity to kind of surprise them and show them a different way of doing that. So we landed this incredible partnership with Coachella. It was kind of an insane thing, had never happened before. So we became their exclusive non-alcoholic partner and it was the first time they had done something like this. That was kind of a crazy moment for us. It was a big inflection point. Um, I think it validated the category really meaningfully and our ability to, I don't know, really create a movement around it. We landed that partnership. The next year we opened West Hollywood. Recently in May, we opened uh, San Francisco. And we did that because we were looking at online sales. We were looking at where our community was based um, across all channels, you know, online, social, getting a ton of feedback from customers around where they wanted to have access to things. And so we placed uh, a couple more bets in in different markets, and it's been pretty interesting to see, you know, how different markets respond to things, what products appeal to different markets locally, and that's where we are today. How much is it? And so when people go in there, are they thinking like, oh, this is going to be significantly cheaper than, I don't know. Than an alcohol. Like what's in their head in terms of price point? Yeah, I think it's a split. There's some folks who definitely are like, maybe when they're first entering the category or first exposed to it, because a lot of the time it's organic foot traffic. You know, people see a beautiful store and they're like, what's this all about? Let me walk in. Um, And so I think inherently we culturally 
have placed a lot of value in a drink based on its alcohol content. And so there's a bit of an education around that. And so once you explain to people how products are made, or once they've even, you know, tried their first drink, they tend to like totally, it, it tends to click. Yeah. But it's I clicking also... clicking for me at the moment. This is great. It makes sense. Yeah. yeah. A lot of the time, you know, it's, it is a consumer with a bit more disposable income that maybe has a little bit less price sensitivity. We certainly try to keep this accessible to as many people as possible. So it's not, you know, going ultra premium or trying to overprice anything. But yeah, it clicks. Either people totally get it and they're like, yeah, you're right. The value of a drink isn't, it's alcoholic content. It's the quality of the flavor, the experience it gives me, the moment it allows me, and not the ethanol. Itself. How much is the phony Negroni? Like this bottle. The here. Phony Negroni retails, I think the, the bottle retails for six dollars. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's really cheap. That's not bad. That's so that's cheap. super, super accessible. Especially for, you know, a craft cocktail. You get two servings out of that one. But there's different price points. Just the same way in an alcoholic store, you could do the top sure. shelf, bottom shelf, and there's really, really good stuff that's yeah. Priced super accessible. That's such a trip to think about because in some way it's like people aren't used to do it. They're not used to shopping like that for alcohol. Yeah. Right. It's like I'm almost thinking, is there a world where in the future, like let's say like your kids, instead like the liquor cabinet doesn't even have liquor in it. It's just a bunch of these bottles that we have in front of us. Yeah. And they're, you know, they're just having sugary good delicious things the kids the kids or the adults no like the kid like the high school kid like that's what you know what i mean yeah I like think... the 16 year old kid going into the quote-unquote liquor cabinet yeah oh they're they're thinking they're gonna like get away with something yeah yeah it's fine i mean these things I don't, i'm sure most people have either done it themselves or seen a friend replace their parents their parents vodka with like water and put totally. it back in the freezer and yeah you know yeah. the parents find out exactly yeah they they do really look in a lot of scenarios because they're intended for adult consumption uh, the flavor profile is very adult. Most kids who take a sip of that phony Negroni are going to make like a yucky face. Is that right? I think so. That'd be an interesting thing to test. Uh, that'd be a very dignified and like sophisticated palate on okay. a child, I think. Okay. To have a, you know, deeply bitter or... I want to try this with my nephew, maybe. That's interesting. <laughs> They're one of my nephews. Being like, All right, boys, we're going to have a cocktail together and just see how that how that plays out. But if they love it, problem. Yeah, I try to offer this to adult, you know, drinking yeah, yeah. age I gotcha. folks. I don't know that that many kids would really love this okay. necessarily, flavor-wise. Where do you want to take this brand? Like, are you just thinking about opening a bunch of stores? Like, how do you think about this? Is it a D2C play? Mm. Where do you think about on the business side of it when you're talking to investors? Like, obviously, you have a thesis. You're proving it out. Yeah. It seems to be working. Mm -hmm. You're getting a lot of data. I would say your customer base is probably growing, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're at the beginning of a trend that I think will continue as time goes on. Mm -hmm. And so the optics of it from the outside look like very healthy. What do you personally want? Like, how big do you want to take this thing? I mean, I would love to take it to the moon. I think there's a huge opportunity in this category. The way that I see the new bar, and I think when you when you see the new bar, you see our, maybe you see our website, maybe you see our physical four walls, right? And so you're like, okay, cool. This is an omni-channel retail play. That's probably what it is. It makes sense. What I've actually found is that a lot of what we do in this on this consumer side and a lot of this curation and, and you know creating space uh, for these emerging brands actually is almost like a bit of a wedge product in a way that allows us to acquire customers both on you know the consumer side uh, like you you know who's looking for an excellent drink but we're also able to support all of these emerging brands that are entering the market right, right? there's such a rush. All of these emerging brands are, are rushing to meet the demand that they're seeing. But, you know, a lot of venues, a lot of alcoholic distributors, a lot of retailers are pretty slow to adopt it at the rate that the innovation is taking place. And so where we've seen additional really exciting opportunity is in supporting these emerging brands and then helping them show up where their dream customer is yeah. and where their dream customer wants them to be, yeah. right? And so it's been incredibly fun over the past year to bring things like this to Coachella and then to Stagecoach and then to continue these conversations with uh, hospitality groups and venues and places that want to cater to these consumers and give them what they, what they are deeply asking for but they don't know how to navigate this category because it's fragmented, it's underserved, and they honestly are looking for a little bit of data 
or a lot of data, as much data as possible, yeah. on how to properly execute a program, a set of products into their spaces. And we've been able to provide a lot of insight and expertise on that front and then get these brands where they want to be as well. I think about it like we had the Wine Society on the podcast. And so mm-hmm. they acquire a bunch of wine brands, essentially. And yeah. they have like warehouses set up across the country. And so their mm-hmm. whole thing is essentially just figuring out your wine profile mm-hmm. and then shipping you what you like. Mm-hmm. And they do it at scale and they do it quickly. And so you're going to get yeah. the goods really fast. And they've they've set up the infrastructure to do that. You could, in theory, be that for the non al category. Yeah. I at think scale. Like, totally. And, and you have a lot of, you're getting data today on yeah. where these people shop. Yeah. what they look like, who they are, what they like, what they what's like. missing, what brands are about to take off, all kinds of things. I mean, I, th- I think it's it's incredible and it's such a, a riveting and honestly mentally stimulating category to be a part yeah, of because it's dynamic. It changes every month and it's really cool to be able to have such insight into how all the moving pieces are, are coming to be. How much capital have you raised so far? We've raised $1 million to date. Okay. So we've operated fairly lean. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, I bootstrapped the company with, it was 80K in capital to start. Sure. Just for the inventory, the lease. Yeah. The, like, you know, building the, the website, getting the all work. that stuff. Um, it was, I was the only full-time employee for the first, like, nine months of the company. That was, like, post-Coachella and all of that it was still pretty lean. So, we, yeah, we worked with a couple of contractors to design the brand we opened the store with like under 20k including the inventory yeah opened it in 6 weeks yeah it's really easy i think about it like like the rigmarole i'm going through with the city just to get alcohol approval is a complete yeah. mess and so in some way you buy yourself a lot of time totally by not requiring any licenses yeah that's really special and so you, you can accelerate really quickly which is great in when you're playing some sort of brick and mortar game mm. i uh, think no it, in any game honestly because there's all of this regulation that alcohol brands, alcohol retailers, distributors are all subjected to because they have to play in this three-tier system. So yeah. not only can you not, you know, you can't distribute your own product. You obviously have to get an alcohol license if you want to sell alcohol. Yeah. You can't have like exclusive partnerships or uh, really, you can't do a lot of things as an alcohol producer or an alcohol distributor or alcohol retailer. And so the non-alcoholic category is amazing because you actually, you can ship this across state lines. You can open a location with with little trouble. So when you're pitching this to investors, what's in the 2025, like what's in there? What's in the game plan? Is it more locations? Is it more of an online presence? What's Mm. the, what's the thing? Yeah, we're going to continue to invest heavily in the platform that we built. I think the consumer side of the business is such a bedrock to what we do and it like truly opens up so many doors for us because we have incredible insight uh we have brand authority and we have this thriving community that wants to show up where they see the new bar has curated a thing right there's like a a bit of credibility and excitement so we'll continue to invest in that we will open more locations but really methodically really in places that are strategically aligned with uh, the opportunities that we want to open our, ourselves up to. And a lot of our focus in 2025 is in bringing incredible drinks to more people and making this accessible anywhere fun is being had. So if you were opening a, a sports bar in Los Angeles <laughs> yeah. and there's like a menu, right? So here's yeah. how my head operates if I'm you. Yeah, yeah. I go, okay. So in a traditional world today, you go to a sports bar, you get the cocktail menu, the beer menu, whatever. You get the drink menu. Yeah. And so like does under it, does does maybe on the other side or at the bottom, it says like the new bar and then it's your list of cocktails, the phony Negroni. Da, right. Da, da, da. Yeah. Like it's... what is what do you think about? And I'm not suggesting you have thought about this, but mm-hmm. in a world where today the term is mocktail, you know, the high mm-hmm. people are offended by that term. Mm-hmm. I get it. No problem. I don't think it's a sexy term either. <laughs> but the new bar is an interesting term. Like it's like. Yeah. So so is it a world where the menu says the old bar and it's like Negroni, Manhattan, and then it says the new bar and it's the phony yeah. Negroni. What does that look like to you? And yeah. then do if you were going to open up a sports bar, <laughs> how much revenue would you project that non-alcoholic mm. as a category would bring in mm. in Los Angeles? Yeah. And you have some data to suggest you know people are obviously shopping consuming. and consuming. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's funny that you say that because a lot of my friends – you know, if they're out or that we're hosting a dinner, they're like, 
is that old bar or new bar, you know, when, when they're holding a drink. So it's funny that they've adopted that, that terminology. So it's a thing. It's not that much of a thing. You know, I don't want to over, <laughs> but, but my friends, yeah, they, they're like, is that old bar or new bar? And so the way we do it now in a lot of our partnerships, we do, you know, non-alcoholic drinks curated by the new bar. Okay. Signals to people like this has been thoughtfully put together. You won't see like a full menu with all of the same brand. I, as a consumer, when I see that, I'm like, eh, you didn't try this hard, you know, didn't try very hard. When you see the hard. brand name, you mean? When I only see one brand, like yeah. if you have three different cocktails I or four that. cocktails and all the spirits are one brand, I'm like, I hate that. everybody's really good at something, but yeah. not all things. And so I agree with that. I hate we, that. We work on that. Um, and we really work closely with our partners to do that. And so that's helpful. I think it's interesting to see the way things have evolved in Europe. I think there's a world eventually where maybe we start to talk about ABV, you know, and the way you look at beer, there's like so this would be 10%, like zero 8%, ABV. zero ABV. I don't know that America is quite there yet. That's fascinating, actually. Yeah. So it doesn't even have new or old or mocktail or not. But it can get lost. So it's a bit of a trade off, right? So if I'm somebody who's not drinking alcohol, I might not really go look at the alcohol section. But as I'm scanning, if I see a non alcoholic category, then I know there's something interesting I should look at and pay attention to. So I still am an advocate for a non-alcoholic category of its own and creating credibility and like really just thoughtful curation of that program. And if you're opening a sports bar, I mean, I think an interesting way... Like what's on the menu? What's Oh, what's on the menu what's at on the, the menu? sports bar? What's curated by the new bar? What's on the menu? Oh my gosh. I mean, I you have to have a great selection of beers. I think a lot of the time people are like, yes, I have a non-alcoholic IPA. I'm good. Uh, but I have a menu of like, I don't know, 15 or 20 wow. beers, right? You want to try to have some level of, you, right now we're not going to have full parity, but like give people a couple of options. If I don't like IPA, I should have a another beer. Okay. This is a Kolsch. I like Kolsch. Personally. What's it called? Nani? Nani. Nani. This is a Canadian brand, okay. small producer. I really like their I've stuff. I've had Partake before. That's that partake a, is good. Partake, good. it's great because it's super low carb, low calorie. Yeah. And so even more so than like athletic brewing, which is marketed is another as such one. a... Yeah. yeah. And so I, I would think about like every time somebody's ordering water because you don't have a non-alcoholic, more exciting option that could be a meaningful That's amount of revenue. It. That's a really interesting data point. Okay. Yeah. It's an opportunity it. cost, right? And so... Because uh, it's free. Interesting. It's free. They're looking it's to water. hydrate themselves, not so much have water. Yeah. No, and, and, and sometimes, you know, I'm not going to claim all water is going to be non-alcoholic sales, but... This is an interesting point. Actually. When I'm a consumer and I'm looking at a menu, I'm like, okay, there's no non-alcoholic option. Can I have a club soda and a wine glass? At min- that's what I do. I'm like a club soda in a wine glass because I still believe in you the want psychological s- impact. The social of- proof. I just want to feel less lame or like less boring. You put a lemon in it. Put a lemon. Lime. Okay. Lime. Got it. But I'm not being charged for that club soda, and you're missing out on what otherwise would be, you know, seventeen to twenty-two dollars from me, which I would happily pay, by the way. Right. You're Every there time. anyway. You're having a good time. Every time I would it's pay, not and a I might even have thing. two. I could have three, and there'd be no consequence. I could drive home. Yeah. So I really think about the opportunity cost of not wow. having a program that your consumers are candidly all looking for. I like all of this here. Good stuff. It's really good stuff. You've done an incredible job. What Thank else should you. people know? What hmm. should you leave people with? Besides, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a new fan. I'm sold on this. This is great. I'll be a shopper. Yeah, I think really, that really the good. thing I talk about, and I'm glad you liked so many of them, but there's, there's something in this category for everyone. It doesn't have to be the case that you have to quit drinking entirely. You know, taking a like a sober month, like a dry January or sober October is incredible yeah. because you'll notice some serious changes in your body that can change your mind about what your long-term drinking looks like. But even that is not necessary, right? There's a world in which you can incorporate something that's equally delicious and rewarding and helps you unwind, even if it's Monday through Thursday. And so I'm all about like incremental behavioral changes that actually end up having a really positive long-term impact. I love it. Where can people find you? Where can they buy? Where can they shop? Tell tell everyone. So you can find us in Venice, in West Hollywood, uh, and in San Francisco. We have locations in each of those places. And then we do ship nationwide. So you could shop at thenewbar.com. And you should definitely hang out with us on Instagram at thenewbar too. 
Thank you. Thanks for coming on the pod. Thank you for having me. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.